Hi, Salman. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? I'm okay. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Salman Hamid. Uh, you are at Hampshire College, where you are Associate Professor of Integrate, Integrated Science and Humanities. Um, <clears throat> your formal training is in astronomy, I gather. That's where your PhD is. And you are head of the Center for the Study of Science in Muslim Societies. And that's what we're going to talk about, science in Muslim societies, and more specifically, evolution, beliefs about evolution um, in Muslim societies, and the prominence of creationism, which may be growing, but we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about uh, what, what the causes are of a fairly widespread uh, creationism in Muslim societies, and what you think the consequences are. Um, but first, why don't we kind of get a sense for the prevalence of creationism. Now, in the United States, I think somewhere around 40% of the people polled believe in evolution, so to speak. Um, and that's actually considered low by, the, by European standards. But what kind of numbers do polls reveal in, uh, in Muslim societies? Well, so if you were to uh, talk to me a few years ago, uh, in fact, about five, six years ago, uh, I would have said that uh, the numbers are quite dismal and very low level of acceptance of uh, evolution. Uh, and that was because very limited studies were available. Today, and I've done interviews uh, in different countries, and I actually cannot give you a straight answer. And one of the reasons is uh, it depends upon what is meant by evolution. Mm -hmm. and how people interpret it to be uh, what evolution is. And there are huge variations. So I think this is something that we can uh, get into, but I am, uh, over the period of time, over the last five, six years, while conducting oral interviews and talking to people about what evolution means, I have become actually quite skeptical of simple poll numbers, especially when there is one question they are asking questions about other things, and then one question comes in, oh, by the way, do you accept evolution or not? Mm -hmm. And I don't know actually what people are responding to. So, now, but I think I've seen in your writing some numbers that came from somewhere, right? Yes, so, so this is actually, what, again, one of those things that uh, I had a paper in Science in uh, 2008, and those numbers were from a survey, and uh, and, and those numbers were such that uh, the highest acceptance, it had about seven countries, six or seven countries, and the highest number of acceptance was in Turkey, where it was only 26%. Uh, and then other countries were lower than that. Didn't Kazakhstan have a surprisingly oh, high right. number? Kazakhstan actually was around 40, 45%. Right, I was going to ask about that. What is it about Kazakhstan? I mean, Kazakhstan was kind of an outlier, which I wouldn't have necessarily predicted. I, I'm kind of suspecting that this is more a reflection of what you're talking about, the difficulty of getting a clear answer to a to a consistently phrased question or something right so, so this is again so 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 one um point that i would like to make so this was a study yes kazakhstan was higher and at that time the assumption was and i think probably it is more or less correct and that was uh it is coming from a soviet system so it's a former soviet republic uh -huh. and so it also takes some time there would be a lag in terms of changing of systems as well mm -hmm. so that is also a potential uh, nevertheless, uh, that particular study, and yes, I published it, I, I did use uh, some other data, I claim responsibility for that, uh, but the phrasing of the question mm -hmm. was actually quite problematic. Uh, so uh, the phrasing of that question was that, do you believe in Darwin's theory of evolution? Okay. Now, at that time, we didn't have much information about evolution views in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So that in some sense you can think of it that was a very rough map uh, mm -hmm. if, if you're if you're thinking about pluto for example these recent missions so it would be like a very hubble space telescope image of pluto mm -hmm. you know and you get a rough idea it's going there but then actually the spacecraft goes over there and say oh actually it's much much more complex and not what we expect mm -hmm. so that particular study uh because the phrasing of the question is do you believe in darwin's theory of evolution or not it brings in darwin's name and it depends upon what do people mean by that. And second, that particular question was asked as an indicator of atheism. 
in that particular study, which again is a problem because it doesn't have to be related to atheism, but the way the study was formulated, it was the study was about uh, about Muslim religiosity. So you mean they had already heard other questions by the time they answered that one that were clearly putting this in the context of religious belief? Yes. Uh, well, uh, that is probably It was about religiosity, and within it, there was a question in there. So again, as I said, like you know, that it was useful from the perspective because not having any idea, it's better to have at least some footsteps. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but now, if you ask me, what do people think? My answer would be actually we don't really know, and there are some claims that we can make. Uh, so and, and again, we can get into the details about it. Uh, but one claim that we can make is that the American version of creationism which is young earth, uh, the earth being six to 10,000 years old and everything being created after that, that idea is pretty much more or less absent in the Muslim world. That is one consistent thing that we have found in our questions, in our surveys where uh, people believe in old earth. And that in itself already complicates things because as you can imagine, if people I mean, people may not exactly know that Earth is four and a half billion years, but they would have an idea that it's millions of billions of years. Mm -hmm. And then there are people oftentimes have been taking this option, at least of the possibility of changing of species. How much then there are other wiggle rooms that come in? Well, they may have changed into other forms, but not humans uh, or, for example, just microbial. But there are variations within that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but young earth creationism really, in some ways, within the U.S. context, really removes the option of much of the evolution because it becomes illogical. Because right. there, there just isn't, even if you have sympathetic views regarding uh, evolutionary ideas, you simply don't have enough time okay. so, for evolution. So, so, views, so whatever the, the views on whether evolution happened even, and there's a certain sense in which the, the views prevailing in Muslim societies are closer to being consistent with evolution than, than those of a young earth creationist whose view of the age of the earth itself completely rules out the prospect for evolution as we know it. Now, in the case of the young earth creationists, the source of their young earthiness is, uh, you know, is Genesis. There, there's a clear creation story in the Bible, talks about how long it took to create the world, and then there's and then there's a subsequent, I guess it's the lineages of the generations that allow them to calculate, uh, or the, the, that allow them to calculate um, roughly how many thousands of years. What, what is there, uh, and, 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 and I guess the, the, the leave aside the age calculation, the, the most direct seeming uh, contradiction is just the creation story. God created the, wor the world and it didn't take long and he did it directly and he created the species directly. So, is there any, in Islam, is there a, as natural a source of conflict between scripture and evolutionism? Well, not a direct source in that way. And again, uh, since there are over a billion Muslims and there are huge variations uh, mm -hmm. of how people interpret the Quran, uh, there is no single place that people point to when they object to evolution. So let me break it out in two different ways to answer this question. So oftentimes when people talk about uh, the creation story in the book of Genesis, it's all in the first couple of chapters, mm -hmm. right? two chapters or three chapters, how, how you want to look at that. In the Quran, when there is a mention of uh, the formation of the universe or formation of the earth, it is much more sparsed out, much more Set, uh, much more spread out in the book. And so oftentimes it is mentioned in the way that the God is so great, don't you know that the world was created in six days? So the so six-day creation is there, but it is usually mentioned in other contexts. There is no single place where you can go, okay, mm -hmm. here is the full account of creation that mm -hmm. is given, and that's where you are going to go for that. Second, and that is perhaps partly the source why young earth creationism is missing, is that within the Quran it says that, well, six days and the length of days, at some point it says, it could be your 10,000 years. And another place it says it could be your 100,000 years. It says it's in the Quran itself or in subsequent In the Quran days? itself, there are 
different dates that like you know one year could be something else. Right? So, so, so so it actually says you you needn't interpret a day literally in the Quran. Right. Yes. And so that is precise. That is one of the reasons when people think about the age of the Earth, they do not look at just the Quran to see, okay, what is the age of the universe? Because it explicitly says that it could be 10,000, it could be 100,000. Okay. Okay, in the absence of that, as a layperson, and I'm talking about sort of like, another, uh, and what I'm, a lot of my work is, is more about how individuals who are Muslims or not theologians, how do they interpret it? Well, for them, which source should they go to? And they often go to what is the acceptable source, and which is geology. And so they say, well, earth is old because it doesn't contradict with the Quran from that perspective, because Quran doesn't explicitly take a particular stance on the length of the dates. Mm -hmm. So where objections to evolution comes in? Well, first of all, when we ask people, many people have never thought about this question deeply. So, and again, I'm not talking about theologians. We can talk about Islamic scholars uh, in a second, but for many people have not really thought about it. You ask them and you go, like, because it's not in the public, in the controversial the topic in the way the U.S. is. I mean, in the mm -hmm. U.S., I mean, you have to be, if you are a Republican presidential ca candidate, right. you have to know the answer to that or how to evade that answer. So when people object to evolution in the Muslim world, what we have found is that often it's a story of Adam. And it's like, okay, does Adam have an ancestor? Is Adam linked with other beings or not? Because, because Adam, is, is, Adam is mentioned in the Quran, right? And we should say, for people who don't realize this, that by and large, the Hebrew scriptures are embraced in Islam and, and the Christian story as well. Uh, as, um, you know, so, you know, it's, this, these are not as sacred as the Quran, obviously, but, but they are, uh, they're respected. They're, they're, they're kind of there in the background, the stories from both the, the Hebrew and Christian traditions. Right, they are considered actually the books of God, yeah. except like they're considered that, well, they got modified. Mm -hmm. and, and so within the Islamic tradition, what it says is that, you know, that uh, both uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament were modified. They were, they were originally revealed by God, but then they got modified. And hence, there was a need for an unmodified book, which is the Quran. And so those, and so a lot of the stories uh, which are in the Judeo-Christian tradition are the same stories which are in the Quran, mm -hmm. and they have similar lineages. Of course, the language is different, and, and the way they are told sometimes there are variations in details, mm -hmm. but the roots are pretty much the same. Okay. So um, there's one other before we get on to kind of causes and and consequences of this. Um, there's one other thing in the Quran. There's a surah. Maybe it's in more than one surah, but this is really kind of an uh, interesting uh, passage where uh, the, the beautiful workings of nature are used as proof of the existence of God. This is what would be called natural theology in the Western tradition. And what it says is, you know, you know there isn't a lot in the Quran in the way of miraculous signs, you know, signs in the sense of miracles. But what this passage says is kind of, you want signs, here are the signs. And it talks about how, you know, the trees grow, the, the, the you know, grain grows and people can eat the grain. And, and, it, and it's all about how nature, you know, works, is, is, is woven into this beautiful uh, and interdependent whole. Is that, uh, is that an issue here at all? That I mean, that is not itself, in a certain sense, incompatible with evolution, because you can imagine that God would have used evolution as the instrument to create all this. But does, does that come up at all? In this debate? Well, it comes up because uh, and one of the reasons I got interested in this study was because we wanted to look at how Muslims, and especially young Muslims, look at modern science. But we looked at evolution because if you ask people, what is the relationship between Islam and science? And pretty much invariably you get the answer, the relationship is great. And oftentimes people quote, and there are actually not just one passage, actually there are many passages in the Quran that says that, well, look at nature, because that's where the signs of God are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should study nature. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of emphasis on studying nature in order to see the signs of God and or the wonders of creation and natural theology, as you mentioned. So that is explicitly mentioned. And that is very widespread belief, and it's, uh, it's shared by many people. So that's precisely the reason when you ask people about the relationship between Islam and science, people say, well, that is great. Okay. Now, the reason why we picked evolution 
to really investigate how they think about that is because evolution is a topic where not everybody agrees whether it contradicts or whether it's consistent with Islam or not. And then you start seeing these variations. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, I mean, uh, I think you are absolutely correct about uh, a lot of people using those verses for the justification for the sciences in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, they're very, they tend to be pro-science uh, societies in principle at least. Yes, uh, and in fact, uh, so, so if you, again, uh, I mean in some sense uh, you can also say that it, it loses its meaning because everybody gives the same answer. Yes, Islam and science are great. Mm -hmm. but. But the de but it's in the details that things become more interesting of how they define science and how they think about science. Now, uh, are, you, and, are you concerned that that could change as a result of if, if creationism becomes a more and more kind of well defined and firmly entrenched thing that it could influence attitudes towards science more generally? Well, I mean, uh, the way people reject or the way people categorize evolution is bad science. Or they, so they say Islam and science relationship okay. is great. So again, uh, I've looked at when we have interviewed people, people would reject evolution. People would think evolution contradicts Islam. But when you ask them this question about Islam and science, they would say, oh, the, uh, the relationship is great, mm -hmm. right? So they are looking at evolution in a different context. Now, not every place, uh, but, but, but in, in those places and those individuals, even those individuals who reject evolution, seem to think that Islam and science relationship is great and evolution is either bad science or old science. And so there are ways that people refer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, what in this context, and this may be a little bit of a, a digression from the topic we are talking about, but there is a, in terms of concern that I have is actually on, the, on another end, and that is you mentioned about the lack of that much uh, mention of miracles in the Quran. But in the last, uh, it started in the late 19th century, but in the last 40 years or so, 40, 50 years, there has been a real trend of people finding some modern science or evidence of modern science in the Quran. So you can find, so people would look at the Quran and they would say, well, look, in order to look for the proof that it is a divine book is that in the seventh century, there is a mention of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity or quantum physics or expansion of the universe and so on and so forth. Okay. And, the, and, these, and I assume it takes a certain amount of metaphorical interpretation to get this out of the Quran. I doubt you see the right. word relativity. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think, and, and I think it, if you ask me what is a bigger concern, I think uh, in some sense uh, from, a, from a perspective of wonder and curiosity that drives science. To me, this is a bigger problem because it, in some sense, assumes what the answer is. And then you go into the Quran and you interpret those words and think you are doing science. Mm -hmm. But that is not sciences. Uh, and, uh, and so, and, and this is a very popular term. It's called ijaz. It's a very popular thing. It's not just... Wait, what, what does that term mean exactly? It's called ijaz, uh, I-G-A-J-A-Z. That's what it's called, this particular way. It, it is about finding miracles. It's about mirac miraculousness of the Quran in some sense. I see. And, um, and, 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 and so is, uh, having anticipated scientific discoveries would be one kind of example of, a, of, of, a, of a, uh, a sign that the Quran is God's word. That's right. And, and it has a fascinating history because up until uh, in the 19th century, uh, it was actually used by a lot of the missionaries uh, they've used science because it was Western science, it was Christian science to mm -hmm. show the superiority of Christianity. But then a lot of the local Muslim scholars actually inverted it and they said, oh, by the way, here is a science that, was, that is coming from uh, the Christians that was discovered by the Christians. But guess what? It was already in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And that trend became very popular. And, uh, and then it, in the 1970s, there was this book, um, Bible, Quran and Science by a French medical doctor, Maurice Bucale. He really promoted that book, that book became a huge bestseller in the Muslim world. And, uh, and in some sense, that trend is, uh, is very popular today. And, and, I, and I should mention that it's not just that the Muslims find this. I mean, the, you, you can also find books about uh, science in Bhagavad Gita. You can find also science in the Bible. I mean, there was also a variation of that Bible code, for example. So there are a lot of people who are looking for validation from science.
It's just that in the Muslim world, it's a much a broader phenomenon. And, uh, and partly it's because uh, it's the, how do you prove the miraculousness? And if you can bring in science to show that is behind you, then that's the most powerful weapon you have. Okay. So um, if science could in principle be reconciled with Islam and the Quran, perhaps more readily than it could be reconciled with literal reading of uh, the Bible, um, why do you think it is that what evidence we have, at least, suggests that there's a pretty substantial reaction against evolutionism in Muslim societies? Yeah, so this is, uh, so let me give you a contrast, uh, and perhaps that would be an easier way to think about it. Uh, there are a couple of places where we know evolution has become a flashpoint. Uh, one is Turkey, and that name comes up uh, quite often. Uh, in Turkey, there is a almost a, a pretty open public battle over evolution, where uh, again historically the secularists that were in, po in power also, and the Islamists that are now in power, and that is the rising middle class, and which is relatively more conservative. Right. There is a split between them, and evolution is one of the splitting points. Right. So, you, so, so you've got this, an educational system that was set up by avowedly secularist right. regimes, and now you have an influx of quite religious Muslims into the middle class and hence, you know, more into higher and higher levels of education, I guess. And oftentimes the secularists used the rejection of evolution as a sign of ignorance. I can say, okay, look at those people who are rejecting evolution, and hence they are also bad. Mm -hmm. Well, so as the Islamist power has increased, well, they have also appropriated that, yes, of course we reject evolution, and it's the secularists who are either, they would call them atheists, or they would call them materialists, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so there is a very public split over that, and evolution shows up in... Um, in university campuses, there are debates about that. And in fact, I was uh, I attended one of the first creation conferences that happened at a university campus. That was two years ago, three years ago actually. And um, and I just happened to be there uh, doing my research, and I found out that there was this creation con creationism conference taking place. And there was riot police outside, and there were people chanting. And inside, and so, so outside, there are. Uh, th th there is right police in the right gear and people really upset and the people who are upset are the secularists or the academics who don't think any creation mm -hmm. content should take place inside. Mm -hmm. You go in and we, we managed to, me and my collaborator, we actually managed to go in and inside, yes, this was a creation conference, but the way they framed it was that, look, outside the secularists talk about freedom of speech mm -hmm. and things like that, but look, we are just having a conference. All we are saying is that, well, there should be an alternative to Darwin. At least we should hear about them. Here they are stifling this debate. Mm -hmm. right? So some of the rhetoric is quite familiar because that's uh, some of the uh, rhetoric that we see in the U.S. as well. But you can see that it's a, it, it becomes a political issue right from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it, that in, in Turkey, it may be fueled by this this tension uh, between the traditional secularism no. and, and... No. In okay, Pakistan, uh, we, and we have a paper out that we did. Uh, we interviewed Pakistani medical doctors who are working in the U.S. And we have also interviewed uh, Pakistani physicians and medical students in Pakistan. And what we find is that actually... Uh, for as the question, if you ask the question, and these are oral interviews, so, so it takes, we, we ask this question about their personal acceptance or rejection somewhere in the middle uh, of our interview. Mm -hmm. So we do ask them the question about, well, do you personally accept evolution or not? And then we go and ask other questions about what about microbial evolution? We ask them about uh, animal evolution. We ask them about human evolution and, and so on and so forth. And we found that amongst Pakistani physicians and medical students, so this is a sort of like, you know, educated group, uh, much of them, more than half, have no problem with evolution. Mm -hmm. And the ones that were in the U.S., that are practicing medicine in the U.S., even though they were all educated in Pakistan, more than half actually accepted human evolution as well. Mm -hmm. And in Pakistani, and in and, 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 and the textbooks in Pakistan, evolution is included, except that human evolution is simply just not mentioned. Mm 
It doesn't go out to say that human evolution is wrong. It's just not mentioned. Uh, there is a Pakistani Museum of Natural History. I was just there about uh, a month ago. Uh, and there, are, there is an exhibit on evolution, mm -hmm. which actually includes uh, humans as well. It just mentions that. It doesn't go into the details of uh, that there are common ancestors and things like that, but it, it just shows you the diversity and, and evolution. Mm -hmm. Now, is it the case that in many of these societies, um, traditionally just the nature of education and maybe the average level of educational attainment has been such that traditionally the issue has just literally not come up. Like you, you, would, you would go through what schooling there was and you, and you just wouldn't encounter the theory of natural selection. Has that been the case until recently? Is it still the case for, for a lot of people? Well, uh, yes, to a certain degree, that's correct. And, uh, and, and so when we are thinking about the Muslim world, we should uh, keep that in mind, that mass education really uh, impacted uh, late 80s and early 90s in much of the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at first, second generation mass university graduates. Uh, and in some sense, that is linked to the kind of Arab Spring and different types of movements that we are seeing. It's mm -hmm. not simply that there is something political in particular that's happening, we are also seeing a demographic shift, an education shift, and people are m like much more middle class, broader middle class, broader segment of the population is getting educated and asking different types of questions that were not there in the first place. Okay. Now, so that is correct, that that kind of questions may not have come up. Uh, however, I would answer it in two ways. One. It, evolution questions did come up in the late 19th and early 20th century. Not everybody was involved in engaging with those questions, but a lot of Muslim scholars did address those. And the reason was that at that time, the question was, well, why is much of the Muslim world either under colonial rule or under basically in a weakened military situation, uh, like in Turkey or in Iran? And a lot of the scholars actually were split. Many said that, well, we need to accept science. And in some sense, this Islam and science narrative that Islam and science are compatible was framed in the late 19th century in response to the European domination. And the response was that Muslims have to accept science. This is essential for progress. Mm -hmm. And Islam in itself is inherently in favor of that. Right, so, so then you can actually talk about those verses. And, but a lot of those, that narrative was formed in the 19th so, century. So in the late months. 19th and early 20th century, the scholarly reaction, and I assume you mean to include the religious scholars who have so much authority and influence over religious doctrine and interpretation, that reaction to evolution was basically favorable in the, in the, in, initially. Uh, many of them, many of the most prominent scholars actually said, yes, uh -huh. uh, evolution is not a problem. Uh, a lot of the, uh, so it becomes tricky of how do we define religious scholar, right? I mean, like, you know, right. I, I would say that a lot of the spokespeople who were speaking for Muslims, some of them were religiously trained and some of them were still spokesperson for, for Islam. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and many of them actually supported this idea of evolution. There is a twist to it. Uh, in fact, the most famous example is of Jamaluddin Afghani. So Afghani is a reformer. He was, um, he's a complicated figure, uh, but he lived, uh, he died in late, uh, in 1890s. And he really wanted, uh, like, you know, this, this narrative of Muslims and science, they should progress and so on and so forth. Now, he actually initially rejected evolution. And I'm giving you his example because this actually gives you the mindset. In 1880s, he was one of the first prominent people to explicitly reject evolution. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason he rejected evolution was because he was responding to Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who was a reformer in India, uh, at that time under British India, who was accepting evolution. But, but Sayyid Ahmad Khan was also pro-British values. Sayyid Ahmad Khan's reform was that, look, Muslims need to adopt British ways, British values, including British science, mm -hmm. and evolution is a British idea, hence Muslims should accept it. Mm -hmm. Afghani was anti-colonial, mm -hmm. and his point was that, and so he's responding to Sayyid Ahmad Khan, and he said, Sayyid Ahmad Khan accepts it, so I completely reject it. Now, so, so in, uh, well, go ahead. 
And later in life, actually, uh, uh, he actually changed his position. Afghani changed his position. And, uh, and, and after his death, actually, the article that was published about him, uh, from him, uh, said that actually he thought that evolution is a completely acceptable idea within Islam. Mm -hmm. But with a twist. And he said, and Darwin didn't come up. This was not an original idea of Darwin to begin with. This idea was given by Muslim scholars way back in the 9th and 10th century to begin with. And he called Darwin a mere specimen collector. So you see this, so this, so this goes back, this gives a picture that in some sense, it's not about evolution as a research perspective. It's not about evolution as a predominantly like theological idea, but this is again, goes back to this political and cultural debates that evolution is coming in. For Afghani, when he accepted it, he appropriated it. Well, now it's our own theory. Uh -huh. So acceptance of evolution is not a problem because this was an idea given by Muslim scholars to begin with. And just out of curiosity, how close were these Muslim scholars from a millennium or so ago, how close were they to articulating a theory of evolution? I mean, I doubt they got the natural selection part of it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but were they explicit about the you know, gradual change in species or what? Right. So, uh, so this is an issue where, uh, and again, so a lot of the times now when people even accept evolution, they actually refer to these scholars from the 9th, 10th, and 11th, and even 14th century. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two issues that come with that. One is uh, they are addressing those questions within the context of their own time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is based upon the scala natural. I like, can you know, sort of like know that everything is, uh, is chain, a scale chain of being kind of chain of beings, and I like, you know, so they are looking for those species within it. Mm -hmm. Now, some did mention environmental effects can change uh, species. Some also mentioned like you know perhaps um, monkeys may are maybe closer to humans. So there is there is a mention of that. Mm -hmm. But the problem oftentimes when people make those claims is uh, that they take those claims but ignore. There are other ideas that may not fit in with the modern evolutionary sense. So, for example, al Jahez, one of the persons that is mentioned, but oftentimes in their schema, in their scheme of change of beings, it includes angels also, for example, or other species as well. So you would think, well, that is not really evolution in the way we think about natural selection, the way we think about. It. So, yes, they did talk, many of them did talk about the potential of change. Many did talk about, like, you know, that there may be environmental impacts that do that. But the modern theory of natural selection, the framework is very different in the right. way Darwin is thinking about it and the way other people are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, nevertheless, it's not something that was completely rejected out of hand. Okay. So I gather that one thing that's going on is that uh, if people in Muslim societies reject Western influence, particularly uh, colonial, uh, you know, implicitly or explicitly colonial kinds of influence, and they associate uh, evolution, evolutionism in a distinctive way with Western influence, you know, this being something that's, that's characteristic of Western culture, then that's one thing that can drive a reaction, I gather, against an evolutionary worldview. Now, with that as background, what kinds of things going on in the world today do you think are influencing um, acceptance or rejection of evolutionism? So, one of the so, in terms of textbooks, and this is the battle in the U.S. often is about what is included in the textbooks or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we have looked at uh, textbooks from several Muslim countries, biology textbooks, and with the exception of Saudi Arabia and uh, Oman, as far as we know so far. Most countries, the biology textbooks include mention of evolution or a chapter on evolution, uh, including Iran, Pakistan, uh, Egypt, Malaysia. In all of those places, actually, there is a mention of, uh, of evolution uh, as a fact of science. Mm -hmm. Human evolution, as I mentioned, is not mentioned in any of these textbooks. It is not that people say, like, no, human evolution is wrong. It is just not mentioned. Mm -hmm. okay, so that is one thing that is going on. Uh, now, what do teachers do? So there are other people who have studied, like, you know, well, teachers oftentimes give them, you know, it is in your textbook, it is going to be in the exam, but it is not true. Mm -hmm. What do students remember? 
it is all over the map because a lot of the people actually don't, a lot of the students, again, we have interviewed these medical doctors and medical students and not, many of them don't even remember what the teacher said. Mm -hmm. They said, oh yeah, it was in the, in the textbook, so it may be okay. So, but the fact that it is included in textbooks is a really positive thing because in some sense, this notion that textbooks contain knowledge that is true mm -hmm. to various degrees. So I think that element is a positive one. On the negative side, uh, another place where I'm concerned with, and that is issues that are taking place in particular in Europe, uh, and, and now actually more or less more coming up in the US as well, but certainly in Europe. Just like Turkey, where a rejection of evolution in some sense can become a political topic and a topic where it can be shown or it can be used to show the ignorance of a particular group. Mm -hmm. In Europe, evolution shows up in debates, in public debates, especially in England, and it has also come up in other places, in France, uh, it has also come up in Belgium and, uh, and other places. And oftentimes, it is used as the backwardness of Muslims. And, and, and that, uh, that Muslims, and so this is a larger debate that is taking place in Europe about the place of Muslims, and and what, is, what is the reaction to that? When, when, when creationism is depicted as a sign of the backwardness of Muslims, does that increase the power that creationism has in, in, in Muslim societies? or In Europe, yes, absolutely. Because, I mean, in some sense, I mean, you can see that uh, there is a parallel to that with the hijab debates. Mm -hmm. right? like, you know, because then right. it demarcates. So if you are, so let's assume if you are in England, a lot of these debates are taking place in England. Charles right. Darwin is from England. The origin of these new ideas are in England. Uh, you say, well, this is the way of marking yourself different from the dominant society. Right. So if I am a minority over there, and I'm not necessarily talking about migrants because uh, mm -hmm. more than half of Muslim population in Europe was born in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so if they are looking at it and they are looking at ways to differentiate themselves from the majority culture. So hijab is one way. Uh, the, issues hijab coming, referring to the head covering that, that uh, Muslim women covering. wear. And I think a lot of people don't realize that in a lot of places, that is much more common now than it used to be. There was a That's time when many yes. fewer Muslim women felt uh, compelled to wear head covering. And it's a fairly recent thing. And it becomes a matter of identity because it describes, right. okay, so how am I different? Well, this is one of the places where I'm different. And oftentimes when minorities are looking to establish their identities, the clashes take place in public places. Uh, you can, it would take place in workplaces. So there are issues of fasting, issues of uh, prayers, mm -hmm. uh, or in schools, public schools, so the issue of hijab, and on the issue of evolution. Mm -hmm. It is increasingly becoming an issue. And so here is a factor where even if there is a little bit of a controversy, and again, we only hear about evolution and Muslims in Europe when there is a controversy about the rejection of evolution. So we actually don't hear, there is not a big news article when it comes up, hey, there, is, there are all these Muslim students that all accept evolution and there is no controversy. Right. So there is a, in there, there is an inherent nature of, uh, of debates where... Uh, only it's a controversy. You see the headlines mm -hmm. only when there is an issue of rejection. And then it gets framed in a way that this is a threat to our education system. So within the Europe, and, and this is all, I, I would say ironic, but whatever we want to call it, because it's, it's very interesting, because in the, U, in the U.S. it would be a very different debate between the rejection uh, of evolution and conservative values. But in Europe, it places it in the context that it is the Muslim minorities that are a threat, they reject evolution, hence they are backward, and it is a threat to our education system that is coming in. Now, are the forms of creationism that have uh, surfaced in the West in the past few decades, including, for example, intelligent design, well, actually, there's some question as to whether intelligent design is creationism per se, it largely consists of just kind of casting doubt in a vague way, on the power of natural, on the ability of natural selection to account for an evolutionary, much in the way of evolutionary uh, design and so on. But um, th these various, uh, you know, religious uh, reactions against mainstream evolutionism in in the United States and elsewhere in in the West um, have those have those had an impact? Absolutely. 
Uh, so a lot of the, uh, not the new types, but certainly uh, the scientific creationism, which started in the 1860s, when, uh, 1960s when the book started coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, that is within the context of uh, getting creationism into schools as a science in the U.S. I think those books do have an impact because people actually know it's a globalized world. It's the, it's everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. So people have heard those things. And oftentimes the arguments that people present of why they reject are often coming from that kind of creationism. And in this particular regard, uh, Harun Yahya, whose name comes up, he's a guy in Turkey who has glossy books and he became quite popular in the, especially in the early 2000s in terms of his rejection of evolution and he presented himself as the leading creation, Islamic creationist. He in particular borrowed heavily from creationists in the US and, the, and he borrowed material and in some sense Islamicized that and what that means is that he removed for example the young earth references and so you have similar type of um, arguments but presented in an older, uh, which includes, well, why are there missing links? I have never seen a monkey turn into a man, and so on and so forth. So these, all these misconceptions, right. he, he would just take those. And he didn't mind taking intelligent design either, because for him, I mean, in, again, in the U.S., as you mentioned, I mean, intelligent design is a particular political strategy to get maybe, like, you know, uh, teaching of uh, creationism uh -huh. into schools. Well, for him, that's not the agenda. It's not the matter. So he also includes intelligent design in it. Bacterium flagellum is alongside with all these other things. You also include that right. with it. And also intelligent design is a, is a generic word. Uh, I mean, here, when we are talking about it, intelligent design is a very specific connotations from the Discovery Institute. But for somebody like Harun Yaya, it would be something that, well, yes, look, everything is intelligently designed. It makes sense. Of course, everything is intelligent design. Mm -hmm. Right? So it loses in that meaning. Um, but I should mention that somebody like Harun Yahya, for example, uh, are rare, and he focused most of his attention towards Muslims uh, in the West. And he believes a lot of other things as well, uh, including he believes that he's a Mahdi, meaning to say like he's a like, you know a savior and other kinds of things. But his rejection of evolution really made headlines especially in papers in the West, because people could relate to it. His creationism was familiar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and are there um, theologians who are uh, working to reconcile evolution with Islamic belief? I mean, saying explicitly, well, evolution could be God's means of creation or things like that? Okay, so this is, is if we look at today, and... Uh, there aren't that many theologians, Muslim theologians, that are explicitly making claims about uh, human evolution mm -hmm. in particular. Again, evolution people, a lot of people can say that, but human evolution, not many theologians are coming out. Mm -hmm. But there are other voices, uh, including Muslim biologists, that are coming out and they're saying, well, hey, look, I am a practicing Muslim and I accept, this is how I make sense mm -hmm. of uh, evolution. Uh, there are other uh, academics, other scholars, other people that are coming out. But this debate, this public debate on the notion of human evolution is just starting in the larger Muslim world. So the, crea so the creative theology is coming mainly from non-theologians. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and again, creative in the I sense would... of, of new theological ideas, not in the sense of creationism theology. Right. And so, so those things are are coming up and that's a uh, for me what's most interesting is this question of who has the authority to interpret right these questions right i mean so unlike the catholic church for example i mean in islam you don't have a central authority right and religious scholars themselves i mean there has been a bit of fight like you know whether they have the authority or not and with the professionalization of science so people think that scientists have always been there but actually science got professionalized in the 19th century the category of scientists is relatively new. And so this question of that when, and, and so this you know, the departmentalization, so if you go to the Muslim world today, any university, it has the same departments as anywhere in the else in the world. So you have biology, physics, astronomy, chemistry, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that raises this particular question that on the question of evolution, who is the authority 
to interpret its relation. And in some ways, and this is where, coming back to your first question about what do Muslims think about evolution, well, there are all kinds of responses to that question. And many people are interpreting. I don't have any problems with human evolution. And the way oftentimes they do that is either they take a deistic view, that well, God started evolution. Natural selection is a law by God. Right. And, and, and never... more specifically, if it's deistic, which I think is what you said, then God started the process and then kept his hands off. And kept his hands off, yes. And, and, that's and, that's, and that would be a pretty radical doctrine, I would think, yes. in Islam. That, I think, is, is relatively rare, but certainly that God is more like the Catholic uh, aspects. I know that God is sort of like actively guiding evolution. Okay. But, or sort the of kind of theistic of... evolution or... Yes. You know. uh, but then there are people who accept evo human evolution for wrong reasons as well. I mean, so oftentimes we think why well, people are rejecting evolution, but we have also found that sometimes people accept evolution because there is a story uh, that is in the Hadith. That those are the sayings of the Prophet. I think it's in there where there is a mention of, uh, of humans being much taller before, right? You know, like uh -huh. so years ago, and now they are shorter. So sometimes people accept human evolution. They say, well, of course, like, you know, people used to be much taller. Now they are much shorter. Right. Uh, and so, but then people reject evolution and their rejections are from misconception sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, they're, uh, they're aware of creationism debates in the U.S., so that's certainly sometimes people like to say, oh, yeah, I've heard that actually evolution is a controversial idea. I've heard like, you know, that there are other competing ideas and there are doubts. So mm -hmm. some of them are aware and some of them are folk rejections. I mean, I think in some sense it because to accept human evolution or accept evolution in general, you need to have an appreciation of deep time. You have to have an appreciation that it takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. And this is not something So, if somebody says, well, I have not seen a chicken turn into a human being. And, and I have actually heard these arguments. Like, people say that that's true. You don't and like, you know, you don't see those changes happen that quickly. So there are also these folk ideas, folk creationism in some sense that is also prevalent. Mm -hmm. But I think these things get blown away or mapped on if there are bigger political or cultural issues. Mm -hmm. These things happen when it's not really, like for example in Pakistan, which is when it is not a political hot button or a cultural hot button topic. Then you have a huge range of responses that people are giving us. Mm -hmm. But in places like Turkey, it becomes far more polarized. And we also found a similar thing in Malaysia as well, where for whatever reason, then we are trying to figure out, like, you know, in Malaysia, there was far bigger rejection of evolution uh, than in other places. So for some reason, in some places, it becomes a definition of being a Muslim. That mm -hmm. as a Muslim, I reject evolution. Mm -hmm. But in other places, it's not. And I think, I think it was in your writing that I saw a reference to the influence that Richard Dawkins' uh, work, some of his work has had, on this debate, is that, is that am I remembering correctly? It's it's in Europe. I think in Europe it is certainly the case. Uh, although not in the Muslim world, we actually asked people about. Uh, so when we did the interviews, also we asked them actually if they knew Richard Dawkins or not. Like you know, if they've heard the name of Richard Dawkins or not. We also asked the name of Harun Yahya or not. And in most places, actually, people don't know uh, Richard Dawkins. But in England, in particular. Yes, there is an impact and his name actually, I mean, it's a polarizing figure within that context because he explicitly uh, oftentimes attacks uh, Muslims within that. So then what is, it, what, what is the nature of the impact? How exactly does the dynamic work? Well, it, it becomes, okay, so as, a, so, I mean, I mean within the Richard, with the Richard Dawkins context, I mean, it, there are a lot of other factors that come in because he has also made statements like the Nobel Prize statement, uh, he had a tweet. I can know that, well, how many Muslims have Nobel Prizes? Uh, Oxford and Cambridge has far more, or just Cambridge has far more, and so on and right. so forth. So it was, he, it was basically, if your religion is, is so great or even makes sense, how come you haven't generated a lot of Nobel Prizes? Right, Prize and so it's those type of uh, statements where, so Richard Dawkins has become, especially in the last uh, couple of years, a very different persona where he is perceived uh, as anti-Islam. And so if he makes a statement and he also becomes, if he becomes uh, the state spokesperson for evolution, right. then for many Muslims, it becomes an easy way to reject it because they go like, well, this is not us. 
it's something else. Evolution idea is something else, and it's for them, it's easy to place a face to it as well, that look, people like Richard Dawkins accept evolution, and they are anti-Islam. Mm -hmm. So I think it is within those battles it plays out. Yeah, he is. He has made more than one tweet that I think could reasonably yes. be interpreted as well. Certainly anti-Islam. Some would say anti-Muslim, but in any event, um, anti-Muslim. Yeah. Uh, the the um, and is it so? There's that. There's the fact that arguably the most prominent spokesperson for uh, evolutionism in the world <laughs> keeps saying nasty things about Islam. I, I I would imagine that would not help the reception of Darwinian theory in in uh, w uh, among those Muslims who, who come in contact with it, at least. But is there, is there a second issue of um, him kind of insisting that if you are a scientifically literate person, if you, you know, then you're kind of obliged to be an atheist? Is that... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that particular line of thinking, and that goes back to this issue of polls as well. Like, you know that uh, p people like uh, um, um, Jerry Coyne, for example, uh, who's a biologist at University of Chicago, he yeah. also often discounts even theistic evolution. He says, "Well, they are pretty much creationists, right?" If we l go from that perspective, that the only evol that only evolution acceptance that we accept is the one that people have to say that pretty much deistic interpretation that God doesn't have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. okay. Then I think if you are giving a choice like that and asking people, do you now accept evolution or not? I think most people are going to say no. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, it's not an unreasonable answer. And the reason is because, yes, for academics and for especially for people who are biologists and people who are studying these type of things, this is a really important topic. Mm -hmm. Our lives are consumed by that. We are always studying about that, of how people are interpreting these questions. But from the perspective of individuals who are living their lives, and especially in Muslim societies, which are often very religious, like, you know, the religion dominates in terms of their culture, their society, their dealings of everyday relations. Now, they are living their life where religion is really important, it's playing a lot of roles, but evolution shows up oftentimes when somebody calls up or interview them or calls up uh, in, for a polling purpose and says, hey, by the way, do you accept evolution or not? Mm -hmm. Well, if they have a choice between rejecting all of that, what they spend 99% of their time versus somebody that calls them whether you accept evolution or not, and if the choice is, if you accept evolution, that means rejection of religion it would actually make sense to reject evolution within that because evolution doesn't play a big role in their lives mm -hmm. for most. But religion does. And religion is not just a doctrinal issue. It's not just an issue of whether, uh, like, you know, what is the origins of Adam and other questions, but religion is playing a role in terms of uh, how you celebrate, uh, like, you know, holidays, how do you make relations to each other, how do you find meaning in life, and so on and so forth. So I think... That is a broader question how, how people think about it. Uh, if I were to uh, give you, so, so I can predict potentially, uh, of course, I, I'm making a prediction for 100 years from now, so uh, we won't be here to answer that. Will much of the Muslim world would have accepted evolution or human evolution? And my answer would be probably. And the reason is because people are also very practical in nature. And I'm talking about general public, not just Muslims, but public in general. Mm -hmm. When we have done the interviews with these medical students and medical doctors, even when they reject evolution, when we ask them, is evolution relevant to medicine? And they said, yes. So because they can see the relevance to that and they don't want to reject that relevance. Mm -hmm. And a parallel to that would be, to these debates would be the debates about heliocentrism. Uh, I mean, yes, the Galileo, Kepler, Newton, in some sense, those debates were settled in the 17th century. But lay people, individuals, they eventually, they, they didn't immediately turn into a different cosmology. Right. But by the 17th, 18th, 18th, 19th centuries, when the almanacs were more accurate with heliocentrism, sun-centered universe, people were like, yeah. And everybody came around, they all interpreted those passages that people thought, are incompatible, they can never become in line, but today that is not a debate at all. Mm 
And in the same way, if we look at it, if we project, this is an issue. Uh, as I've already mentioned, there is no one specific line uh, in, 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 or specific place in the Quran that everybody goes to for rejection of evolution. There is no central authority. I think in a hundred years or so, the evolution is playing such an enormous role in our society, in medicine, in generally genetics is playing such a big role. It's going to play a bigger and bigger role. People will figure out a way to incorporate that in their religious views as well. Again, because I think religion is important unless you give them a choice. That if you are going to do that, you must give up your religion. I think if that is a choice, then no, they are not going to accept it. But I don't think, A, that is the case, that you have to give up religion if you accept evolution. That is patently a false statement because of the existence of many biologists who are religious, the biologists who are Muslim. Uh, and, and in general, people are generally quite flexible and quite pragmatic when it comes to the issues of science. Okay, so so ideas uh, evolve as do species, and uh, and you're you're optimistic about the direction of evolution in that realm. Uh, I think so. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I know your work on this is ongoing, so you'll probably be publishing more things. But we will link to what you've done already. You had the thing in science. I think you alluded to. You had a piece, I think, in the Guardian. Or, or so, yes. So we'll we'll yes, find I'm... that too, and uh, okay. encourage people to read what you've written. And, and uh, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time. Thank you very much. Okay, take care.